Hello, Squaw. <laughs> it's so good to be here. It's so big for me to be here. I live in New York City. <laughs> kind of. I'm kind of with you. <laughs> I live in New York City and I don't get out that much. Unless I'm on an airplane working. Actually, who am I kidding? I get out a lot, but when I'm home, I'm home a lot. And it's deep and it's, it's a lot to live there. It takes, it takes a lot of energy to live there. And so being here in this valley is a really big deal for me. I had this really beautiful opportunity yesterday. I was taking the tram up the mountain and I was looking out onto the valley And I was really overwhelmed by what was around me. I was really overwhelmed by the magnificence of where we are. I was overwhelmed by the magnificence of this world that we have access to. We just forget sometimes that it exists. I was so moved. I was moved to tears. I was standing in the tram just crying because I felt so taken aback by this massive, divine experience of being in this sacred space. And I had this moment of recognition that I don't go here enough. Here meaning nature. I don't go there enough. I don't remember the magnificence of nature. I don't remember the magnificence of some of what we have to experience in this world. And I had this really awesome opportunity to just be in the presence of what this is. And I had a really interesting opportunity to witness my work in action, standing there looking over the mountains and feeling the presence of the mountains and feeling the magnitude of the mountains and feeling the energy of the mountains. I stood there and I just thought, thought to myself, you forgot. And that's such a great metaphor for our spiritual condition. We forget. We forget the magnitude, we forget the light, we forget the presence, we forget to be present in the magnitude of that light. And we all have the capacity to live and dwell in that light, we just forget. And it's the journey that we embark on on our mats, the journey of unlearning and remembering that brings us back to the joy of dwelling in the presence of that magnitude. A Course in Miracles, which is a metaphysical text that I've been teaching for a decade, has this beautiful line where it says we have the descent from magnitude into littleness. And we experience this tiny mad idea, this fear-based tiny mad idea, and we detour into fear. We detour into the darkness and we forget the magnitude of where we are, the magnitude of who we are. We forget. Imagine we're all in this really bright, bright, bright room. A really bright, golden, shiny, awesome, fabulous room. And there is not a single corner of darkness in this space. It's just light. Loving, healing, energetic light. But our hands are over our eyes, squeezed really, really, really tightly, really tightly. And we're screaming, we're screaming, oh my God, oh my God, it's so dark in here. It's so dark in here and I can't find my way out. And all we had to do was actually just lift our hands and remember that we're in the light, remember that we're in the presence of that light. But our hands are held so tightly against our eyes that we forgot. Do you remember when you put your hands over your eyes? Do you remember the time when you placed your hands over your eyes? I was eight years old. I was blessed because I was brought up on these types of yoga mats. I was brought up at festivals. I was brought up at ashrams. I was brought up being named by the gurus and taught to meditate at a very young age. And I had this really hippie mom. I have a very hippie mom who is really, really radical and just, just has been on a spiritual path since birth, since her birth, and has been on a mission of really bringing those principles into my life. And she was blessed me with the, the gifts and the tools. And so I was brought up in this way. And I remember witnessing my mother. My mother is a recovering overeater. 
and an addict. Food was her drug of choice. My mother is an anxious woman by nature. She's just a speedy, anxious woman by nature. And she can easily be swayed out of kilter. But she has a practice. She has a meditation practice. And I remember being eight years old and witnessing my mother very frazzled, standing in the kitchen, eating really fast, and having a moment of recognition, I need to come back, I need to choose again. And I remember witnessing her walk out of that kitchen and go into her bedroom and turn on the mantras. I remember hearing the mantras coming out of the room. And I remember smelling the incense trickling underneath the door. And I remember just witnessing 10 minutes would go by. 10 minutes later, and mom walks out of the room, a whole new person, a whole new presence back in her light. She had a tool that she used regularly of realigning with the light. And so at a very young age, I witnessed what it was like to live in that light. I witnessed the presence of that light. While I had this beautiful hippie mom who was bringing me to wanderlust type festivals and putting my ass on a yoga mat, I also had a beautiful father, but I have a beautiful father, but I had a very different relationship with my father. My relationship with my father was one in which we were very disconnected. And my father had a very strong obsession with successes. And so he became very addicted with my brother's successes. My brother happened to be very good at baseball. And so he used to always practice baseball with Max. They would always be outside. And I remember sitting in the kitchen by myself, looking out the window and seeing my brother and my father playing baseball. And sitting by myself and feeling very disconnected and feeling very separate, feeling very separate. And I didn't know what it was like to have his attention. I just knew that Max got it. That's what Max got. Max has these successes and he gets the attention. And at that time, I hadn't had a lot of successes. I was eight years old, right? It's not a lot of success. But I do have this one memory where I was a child actress, my mom used to bring me in and out of New York City to go on auditions. And my mother brought me like a maniac each week, three or four auditions a week. And finally, I landed a national commercial. And I remember sitting at Hebrew school, waiting for my mom to pick me up because she was coming with the news to tell me whether I got it or not. And I stood there and I was sitting there in my seat and I watched her walk over to the door and she looked in the door and I could see her face in the window and she was like, you got it, you got it. And my mom drove me home that night and she said, your father's really proud of you. And I remember walking up the steps to my house and walking in the door. And my father picking me up in his arms and holding me and saying, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. How could you have this amazing accomplishment? I'm so proud of you. And he squeezed me so tightly. And in that moment, I learned a tiny mad idea. I learned that outward success equals love. And I was hungry for that love. I was so hungry. And I went on for the rest of almost 15 years hungry for that love, looking for that love in outside successes, in outside circumstances, in outside relationships, in romantic relationships with partners that weren't serving me, in my career credentials. Imagine you're this woman with this belief system that says outside success equals love, so you will do whatever it takes to be successful. You got that? You know what I'm talking about? And so I went for it. I was really a untethered force of nature. And I, I went for it. And so at 21 years old, I, I started my first business. I started a PR business. Prior to that, I had been going home to New York City when I was in college and I was promoting parties because I, I had friends that liked to go to parties and I knew how to sell anything I believed in. So I would just get hundreds of young women into a bar and the bartenders loved it. And so I had this connection to the bar scene and I was also really good at selling things. So I said, okay, great, I'll be a publicist for bars and restaurants. And so you can imagine 
being in New York City, representing nightclubs, doing PR for nightclubs and restaurants. And so this is a very dark scene. It's a scene with a lot of late nights, a scene with a lot of unhealthy people, a scene with a lot of drugs, like cocaine, people wanting to keep that party going, keep that energy pumping. A scene with a lot of seemingly successful people, so you can imagine that was pretty hot for my ego. And so I, I, I detoured far into that fear, building up this world of false pretenses around me, having that president on my business card, and being able to walk into any nightclub in New York City without any trouble, and finding the little people that would be my running buddies, my party running buddies at the time. And so for me, the outside successes of career and relationship and being able to get past that velvet rope kind of weren't enough for me anymore. It just got a little boring. And I was like, you know, I need more. Where is that high that I am looking for? Where is that high? And very quickly, as you can imagine, being on this path and this trajectory, that high started to come in the form of drugs. That high started to come in the form of particularly cocaine. And so I started to run hard and fast with a really seemingly successful crew, which tr truthfully these people and myself were nothing but a dark hole within. And being in this experience of getting deeper and darker into that journey of addiction, I remembered the light. I remembered what was really in me. I had this sense of knowing that there was more for me to do here than to be this party girl with some interesting credential on my business card. I knew there was more for me. I remember sitting in an after-hours party in my apartment with a drug dealer and a woman who I had met the night before, and I had no idea who they were. And they were in my apartment, and we were sitting around doing drugs, drinking whatever, and I remember looking at my stack of self-help books next to my bed. And I, I stared at these people and I said, I'm going to be a motivational speaker and a self-help book author. And they looked at me and they were like, sure. And in that moment, I had that spark of light come in, that remembrance that this is not what I'm here for, that recognition that there has to be more. And so I started to try to get clean. I started telling my friends, you know, I want to get sober. I want to get clean. I want to feel better. I want to not be this dark. But I didn't know how I was going to get there. But the, the operative word is choice. I started choosing. I started saying, I want this, I choose this. And I remember one night I went out with a girlfriend and, and I was like, I'm not going to drink tonight and I'm not going to use tonight. And I remember the moment that I saw that girl with that bag of cocaine and I followed her to the bathroom and my girlfriend was sitting at the table and she watched me walk into that bathroom and she looked at me with disgust and shame. And she just walked out of that bar and left. And that morning I woke up and I was in somebody's home and I had no idea where I was. I was sweaty, I was hungover, and I was depressed. I remembered that I left my handbag with my keys at that girlfriend's house, the girlfriend that had watched me go into the bathroom. So I shamefully had to pull my shit together and go to this girl's house. So I go over to her house and I open the door and I, she had just made breakfast and I could smell the eggs and I could smell the coffee. I knew this was like 8 a.m. on a Sunday. Who was waking up at 8 a.m. on a Sunday? I was going home at 8 a.m. on a Sunday. And I walked into her apartment and I saw her and her husband cuddled on the couch, eating eggs and drinking coffee and watching cartoons. And I had this moment of, that is living. That is living in the light. That is what truth is. That is not where I am. I went home that day and I pulled myself together and I was writing in my journal and I wrote down very clearly, I need a miracle. I need help. And I went to sleep that night and I woke up that morning and it was October 2nd of 2005. I sat in my apartment. I woke up. I closed my eyes. 
and I heard this undeniable inner voice come forward. And this voice said to me, get clean and you will live a life beyond your wildest dreams. And I could not deny the magnitude of that voice. I could not deny what the feeling that voice was giving me. It was so powerful. And you know when you have those moments of recognition when a voice comes in or when a thought comes in or a turning point is right there for you. It's right at your fingertips. And you know that if I just put one foot in, I will be guided to where I need to go. And I said, fuck it. I'm putting that foot in. And that day I got sober. And that day began my journey of unlearning and remembering. My journey of allowing, witnessing. I became very, very present to the magnitude. I became a devoted student of spirit. I became a spirit junkie. I remember riding my rollerblades through New York City from a yoga class to a 12-step meeting to a meditation group at night, and all the while just forgetting about time. I was a child again. I was that eight-year-old girl in the ashram running around. And I had this amazing experience. I've had this incredible experience over the past 10 years of just one day at a time being guided to the next right action of what it is that I need to awaken to the presence of the spirit and the magnitude of the light that is within me and around me. And every single day is a new opportunity for unlearning and remembering. And it's been a real privilege to be a student of the light. It's been a real honor to be a teacher of the light. And to teach is to learn. So as we embark on these journeys of being students and we step out onto our mats, we start to have this call to learn more and teach more. The greatest tool that has guided me through this journey of unlearning and remembering for the past nine years is the tool of forgiveness. As a student of the Course in Miracles, forgiveness is the bedrock of a spiritual practice. Forgiveness, the experience of forgiveness is what guides us to unlearn that fear and remember that love. In that experience of forgiveness, we detach from that past. And so you can imagine one of the main issues in my life that I needed to forgive was my father and that experience and that recognition of that darkness. And so I remember I was um, in 2008, I visit a, uh, for, since 2008 I've been visiting a medium by the name of John of God. And I went to visit John of God in Brazil and he is a trans medium and he gives blessings. And you get set off on a pretty radical journey of life changing crazy ass stuff when you visit John of God. And so I went before John of God and I said, listen, I need whatever it is that needs to come through for my spiritual growth and healing. Give it to me. Show me what you've got. And so my first visit at John of God, I went into, after I went before him and asked for that greater understanding of God and that deeper connection to spirit and to release the blocks to the presence of that magnitude, I sat down in what is called the current. It's an energy. It's a room like this with hundreds and thousands of people meditating. And you meditate in the current of the energy, of all the entities and the spirits and the beings and all the people in that space. And we hold that energy. And I remember sitting there in John of God space in that room, and I heard this voice come forward, and I started to recognize my father was with me in that room. And I saw myself with my father on the beach in Martha's Vineyard, and this is where my family vacationed. And we were walking together on the beach, holding hands. Walking down the beach, holding hands. And in that moment, the tears began to flood, and the peace set in, and the resentment just lifted. In that moment, decades of attachment and decades of anger lifted. They just lifted. 
And so that is the groovy thing about forgiveness. In that moment, I was able to release the past and remember the love and the light of who this man is to me and the relationship that we have been able to cultivate today. Today, my father is my biggest cheerleader. He just loves me and says, go, girl, go. And he, though he's still quite excited about my outside successes, what he is most excited about is my inner work. What he is most moved by is the woman I have become. And that's forgiveness. That's healing. And I want to teach you a minute about forgiveness because people look at forgiveness and they're like, well, how could I possibly forgive my abuser? How could I forgive my husband who, who treated me like crap for decades? How could I forgive that boss that beats me up in my office every day with their language. How could I forgive myself for all that I have done? Many people come to me and say, how do I forgive? And forgiveness is much easier than we make it. I had an experience of teaching forgiveness to someone who I thought already knew. I was at a wedding last week for a really close friend of mine, and we all sort of work in the same field, so my publisher was there. And my publisher is, this is the woman, you can just imagine this, this is the woman who buys my books. This is the woman who decides how much money I get paid and decides whether or not I get to go on that Hay House stage five times a year and just makes the commitment to me. So she's committed. And I'm sitting with her and I'm looking at her and I'm like, you know, Patty, uh, things have been interesting. I've been having some really effed up thoughts lately. And I've been really judgmental and I've been really nasty to myself and others in my mind. And she looks at me and she's in horror. She looks at me and she goes, <gasps> you? <laughs> You're my author. And I go, yeah, 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 don't worry. I got this. The miracle, Patty, is that even though in the midst of that chaos and that darkness and that judgment and that separation and all those attack thoughts, I forgive myself instantly. I choose again. The moment I witness the thought, I recognize I have detoured into fear, I choose again. It is a very simple practice that took a lot of cultivation and exercising but I've gotten really freaking good at it. And so I wasn't actually sitting there to tell her about how difficult things were. I was actually telling her how awesome things had gotten because I've been in this practice of witnessing that darkness and choosing again, witnessing that darkness and choosing again. And that is the miracle of forgiveness, is that forgiveness is simply a choice. It's a choice in any given moment to be the non-judgmental witness of your fears and look at those fears without judgment, with lots of love and compassion, and in an instant say, I choose again. I forgive myself. I forgive this thought. I forgive this person who may have harmed me. I forgive this situation. Most of the time, guys, it's I forgive this thought, right? Am I right? you all probably walk around with some pretty gnarly thoughts. I hear these thoughts. I get to witness you. I get to see you. A young woman told me a story about what she thinks about herself. She, she walks around and she, she's, a, she's a young woman who perceives herself as overweight. And she, when she walks in the streets of New York City and she, maybe she trips over a rock on the street, her instant thought is, Fat girl, you suck. Horrible, right? Horrible. How can we speak to ourselves like that? You know what you say. You know where you go. But we have a way out, and that's what I want to talk about today. We have a massive way out. And it's very, very clear, and it's very, very simple, and we just need to start to exercise it. And many of you, whether if you're here on these mats at this time, you've begun the journey of exercising it. Whether you realize it or not, you are already with me. I had a great opportunity of witnessing what the first step in this process of unlearning and remembering is. The first step is witnessing, non-judgmental witnessing. 
being the witness of your fear, being the witness of when you've detoured into darkness, how you've detoured. I was on an airplane last week. I, I've been traveling a lot. I've been on the road, you guys, since, oh my God, I don't even remember, like almost eight, nine days ago. I was in Nantucket, Santa Fe, here. I mean, it's been, I've, I've run out of underwear. Thank God I manifested underwear today. I was washing my underwear in the sink and I was like, this is not cute. This is not good. And then I was walking back to my room and this woman runs up to me. She's in a little booth over there and she goes, oh my God, oh my God, I just wanted to give you something. I, I love you and I just wanted to give you something. And she's like, I hope this isn't too weird, but we have underwear. <laughs> Thank you, universe. I have been manifesting so many gifts, I don't know what to do. I don't have any room in my handbags, so I'll, I'll get home. But I've been on the road so much that I ran out of underwear. Okay. My first leg of my trip, I'm going from Nantucket to New York, New York to Utah, stopping in Utah to Santa Fe. It was a wicked trip. And I was on my last leg of my trip, and I'm sitting on the plane, and there's no one sitting next to me. And you know that moment, you start Instagramming, you're like, hell yes, the seat's empty. <laughs> And so I get psyched, you know, I'm like, this is awesome. And the doors are about to close and this really heavy set man steps onto the plane and he starts putting his luggage above my head. I'm like, great. I don't want to talk to anybody and now I have to sit next to this man. So he comes and he sits down next to me and I put on my headphones and I start listening to my mantras. I'm just like, I got to get out of here. I started to do my thing and I zen out and the stewardess comes by and she starts to offer us our meal and she says to me, do you want a salad or do you want this sub that has bacon and sausage? Airplane <laughs> doesn't do it for me. And so I, I said, absolutely not, no thank, no thank you, I've got my seeds, thank you. And so I, <laughs> you know who you are. And, and in that moment, the man next to me says, I'll have the sandwich. And the, judge, the judgmental dark side of me goes, oh, God, man, don't do this. I said this in my mind. Don't, don't eat the sandwich. <laughs> and I'm like, it's not healthy. I know you don't want that. It's not going to be good. The whole fucking story, you know, it's like, don't eat the sandwich. So I try to forget about it. I go back to sleep. And I, I used to like to talk on planes, but I got over that. I, I, I talk enough, so... I said, I'm gonna just take a nap. I made my nap, 10 minutes later, the sandwich comes. And it's like, she's gotta put the sandwich on. So he's eating his sandwich and I'm like already awake and I'm pissed off that I'm awake. So I'm like, forget it, I'll just get on the internet. You know, they've got that go-go Wi-Fi now, so we get to do our work and I get so into that on the plane. So I'm sitting there with my go-go Wi-Fi, just getting into it. And I go into the back end of my website because I'm working on the search engine optimization on my site. And so I go into the back end of the site and I'm just twiddling around. And I see this one blog and it says, how to change your diet. And so I go in and I start writing tags, how to lose weight, how to eat more mindfully, EFT for losing weight, addiction to food, Overeaters Anonymous, like I'm typing in every tag you could imagine. And this man looks over at me with his beautiful blue eyes and he says, how do I do that? I looked at him and I said, you're sitting next to the right girl. <laughs> I started to teach him tapping, emotional freedom technique. It unlocks addictions. I start talking to him about my addiction recovery and all that I've been through. I tell him about my mother who was an overeater. I tell him about my book, Make Cause Miracles, and I get his address so I can send him a copy. I get him all hooked up. I start emailing him blogs. I'm like sending him tips. We are in it. We are in it. And he starts to just tell me about how his wife is so thin and his daughters are th so thin and he says, you know, I, I'm so glad that my girls got her genes. He says, you know, I just, I really want to change. I look at him, I say, you've got the first step, man. You just said it. I really want to change. 
Whether you realize it or not, you just opened an invisible door. Your desire to change allowed you to speak up when you were sitting next to a self-help book author. That is how God works, man. You said, I want that, and an invisible door opened. Invisible wings spread for you. And here we are. We've been emailing for a few weeks now. And, and the email exchanges have been beautiful, and the books have been sent, and he's on his path. It's like, I, I did that tapping thing. I think it works. And that's how spirit works. When we have the opportunity to witness our behavior and invite in that presence, that's when we are guided to sit next to the self-help book author on the plane. That's when we land in a seat like this and we have no idea how we got onto this mat. Our girlfriend dragged us here. We wanted to go to Sean Korn's class or MC Yogi or whatevs, but we landed here and we are like, I guess I was meant to be here. We have these moments of divine recognition and divine guidance when we open that invisible door with the simple words, I want to change. That's your first step, people. An invitation a sacred invitation. The next step is to get into the practice of asking. Asking, asking, asking. Spiritual connection is a two-way conversation. This is a two-way street. This is not, uh, I need, I need, I need. It's asking, and then I'll get into the next step. The first step is the asking. So you're in your practice. <clears throat> you start praying. I'm in my life and I'm walking through, and this was two and a half years ago, I'm walking through my spiritual experience and I'm witnessing my life and I'm seeing how I'm feeling quite disconnected physically. I was a great student of A Course in Miracles. I was very, very dedicated to metaphysics. I've been doing all my forgiveness practices. I've been reprogramming my thinking, but I was feeling disconnected. And I started to say, I need, I need a miracle. I need help. Show me what you got. And then one day, out of nowhere, I was invited to a yoga class, a private yoga class in New York City. And I, I go, I, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I don't, I don't really like yoga. But it was a yoga class and a dinner. So I don't like yoga, but I like dinner. So I was like, okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And I wanted to hang out with the people that were going, so I showed up. And I walked into this tiny little yoga studio in New York City, and I saw this beautiful 70-year-old woman with a turban and a gown and beautiful mala beads strung, sitting on this tiny little stage, smiling the biggest smile you have ever seen. So much joy was just beaming from this woman. And the moment I walked in the door, I felt elevated in her presence. I felt elevated in her existence. I felt like the room was starting to expand. This tiny little yoga studio became as big as this tent. It was so magnificent. It was so big. It was so loud. And she wasn't saying anything. Her presence was her power. And so I sat myself down on that yoga mat and I started waving my hands in the air and barking and, and breathing really fast and then hysterically crying, hysterically crying, buckets of tears moving through me. And in the middle of the class, I screamed, I have found my yoga. <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> that teacher was Grimuk who many of you have had the privilege of taking class with here. And you know what I'm talking about because you know the magnitude of her presence. And that prayer that I had asked when I said, I need to know more, God, show me what you've got, I need more, was answered by that invitation to go to that yoga studio that day because not only did I get on that mat that day, but I went the next day, I went the next day, I went the next day, 28 days later, I signed up for a teacher training, 270 hours later, I am a teacher sat nam wahe guru. I am now a kundalini yoga meditation teacher and all of that physical presence that I was longing for in my practice and that 
that busting through of those blocks and that greater connection to spirit has been gifted to me because I asked. I witnessed the detour that I had taken. I asked for help. I was guided to what I needed. Simple, right? Simple. Witness the fear. Ask for help. Be guided back. The third step, we're getting to it. The third step is to be the witness, to witness the miracles that are being in front of you. Because I could have asked and listened and gone to that yoga studio, but not been present enough to witness the light. I could have been walking in on my phone, Instagramming the Buddhas downstairs, talking on the phone as I come in the room, just you know, sizing everybody up, looking at their outfits, thinking about the jewelry they were wearing, figuring out what was for dinner. No. I was witnessing the miracles that were being bestowed upon me, witnessing. And so in the presence of that witnessing, we are gifted the reconnection to the light. And as we become that witness and we become that opportunity of just allowing, allowing, allowing. So you're the non-judgmental witness. You're asking for the guidance. And then you accept what is gifted to you. You accept it. I had this incredible opportunity this week where I was in Santa Fe for four days with five other sisters. I was there with my friend Chris Carr, who many of you may know, crazy sexy Chris Carr. I was there with my friend Marie Forleo. If you're in the business world, you may know Marie. I was there with another few girlfriends who are all on this path of personal growth and development. And they're also very, very, very successful. All five of these women were very successful. And what the darkness of our ego does is that dark ego likes to judge and attack and set separate and bring us out of that light at whatever it costs that judgment and that attack and that separation will detour us into that darkness and so I have this experience where I'm showing up and I'm on that airplane and I'm flying to Santa Fe and I'm in that experience of wanting this experience of transformation but all I can think in my head is oh my god there's so much more accomplished there's so much more organized than I am we were going to a speaking training, and I kept thinking about how their outlines were going to be so much better than mine. And I'm just going to be so left out in this group. But what I experienced was that all judgment, all separation, all attack is dissolved by the light. The first day that we arrived, we were asked to get up and just give talks. In the first hour of being in Santa Fe, I learned more about my sisters than I had known could possibly exist. I saw them pour their truth out into this tiny little room in Santa Fe. I saw them strip down to the core of who they were. I saw them release all that they were wanting to let go of. I saw them go to that ugly cry. I saw it all come forward. I went there with them. We all in that experience, in that container together, returned to the light together. We returned. We restored our energy back to the light. We experienced a sisterhood that I will remember forever. A sisterhood that will never, ever leave me. It's made an imprint in my mind and in my heart. And we had this experience, or I had this experience, of what A Course in Miracles calls the great rays of light. When you go and you do deep spiritual work, and this may happen to you on yoga mats like this, or in a, in a presence of a, of a great divine energy of a group, or the great divine energy of a teacher, where all of a sudden everything is so elevated and everyone in the group is so committed to the light that you forget the darkness, and you experience this moment where you witness these great rays of light come through, and each being becomes a beam of light. You forget, you lose the body, you lose the pretenses of the body, and you experience the presence of these beams of light. And I know this might sound trippy and heady, but I promise you it is available to you. I had this divine moment of just witnessing my sisters as the light, and in the presence of the light, all separation was dissolved. And so I challenge you, as you go from tent to tent, and you walk onto that mat, and you say, My practice wasn't that great this morning. I shouldn't have eaten that vegan brownie. I 
shouldn't have drank so much last night. I'm not nearly as good at my practice as that woman. I wish I could be like that teacher, but I'll never get there. Why did I even bother doing my teacher training? I'll never get there. I challenge you when you're in that separation to choose again and to open your eyes and start to witness what is around you, to witness the light that is around you. Witness that young man in the corner who just took class and he's crying and he's reconnecting and he's realigning and he's back. Bear witness to his light. Witness the light of your sisters and brothers who are laughing as they drink their juices and walk through this incredible mountain. Just simply look up and witness the magnitude of the mountains we are surrounded by. So when you're in those moments of separation and attack and judgment, I really challenge you, I really invite you to just open up, to choose again to ask. You'll be restored, you will be rejuvenated, and all that separation will be dissolved by the light. So you're living in the light now, right? You're witnessing, you're asking, you're being present in the miracle of the light. And life gets really groovy. And then you forget, you forget what it is, you forget what you're here to do, you forget where you're here to go. And you have these moments of forgetting. And you start to think, you know, what is my purpose? What am I here for? What am I doing? I'm, I'm going to this job every day that I hate. Or I'm not living out that practice that I did that weekend in Wanderlust. Or I'm just in this marriage that's not what it's meant to be. And I feel stuck. Anybody feeling stuck? Anybody feeling blocked? I have one last story of how to get back into the light. I have a very, very dear friend who has been a banker for a decade, and he's been stuck in this job where he feels so lost and so blocked and so disconnected from the job that he is here to do. And in that stuckness, in that blockness, he came to me asking for help. He said, I need help. And I said, okay, well, you've been on this journey for a while. You've been doing this work, and, I, and I'm going to start to just give you some tools. And so he started to bring those tools in, but then he got lost. And he got to a really, really dark place, a real deathly dark place of just being pissed about his life. And so I visited John of God again. I go every year. I visited John of God again last March. And I went before John of God and I said, listen, man, I, listen, man. <laughs> Pretty much, we're that groovy at this point. And I'm like, I need, I need a blessing for my friend. I showed him a picture of my friend. I said, I need a blessing. This dude needs help. And he said, okay, go. We got it. And I go home, and I'm sitting with my friend about a week and a half later, and he's just sitting there, and I look at him, and I say, I have a message for you. And I don't know where this was coming from. I was just allowing. There was voices coming in, and I was just allowing. And it was a just undeniable connection. I just said, just, just sit down. I know you're ready for this. I've got a message for you. Your job is not to be the best banker. Your job is not to be the best at the spreadsheets. Your job is not to make the most money on Wall Street. Your job is not to have the best suit in the room. Your job is not to bring in the most clients. Your job is to be the light. Your job is to be the light in a really dark environment. Your job is to leave your positive attitude in an energy where it is so toxic and greedy and negative, in an environment where the boss is leading with an iron fist. Your job is to leave your light. Your job is to give a better perspective to your coworkers. Your job is to raise the vibration by just living in the joy of who you are, man. Your job is to be the light. And for whatever reason, that day, he was willing to receive the gospel of Gabby. <laughs> and he just stood there and he was like, okay, I will be the light. <laughs> and so he went to work and he, and he put on his little outfit, his little Prada suit, the little tie. And he walked into his office and he stood really tall 
And he looked around and he said, I am the light. <laughs> he didn't say that out loud, but he, he said it. I am the light. And I called him about two weeks later and I said, hey, how's it going? Oh, you know, good. Just be in the light. That is the brilliance, people. That is the simplicity. When we dwell in the light and the joy of who we are here to be, all boundaries are removed. All of our intentions and desire to live in our purpose comes forward, regardless of whether we're in that job or in that relationship or in that apartment or in that city that we want to be in. All of that truth comes forward when we start to live in the joy and the presence of our light, when we start to release the boundaries with that light. That is when it is restored. And so you have this opportunity, and this is my call to action for you. This is my invitation to you in the presence of this valley, in this mountainous area at this time. I invite you to get over yourselves. I invite you to release the judgment and the attack and the separation, one negative thought at a time, one attack thought at a time, one moment at a time. I invite you to let go of your disconnect from your purpose and remember that when you are only in that presence of my purpose is to be in joy, my purpose is to be the light, my purpose is to be that yogi who shows up and in my presence the room is vibrating. In my in my presence, the room is magnetic. In my presence, the freaking room begins to expand. That is your job, and I invite you to join me. I invite you to join me on this experience of being in this beautiful, magnificent world at this time, being the witness of all of the miracles that are available to us, taking ownership of the gift that you were given as a Western citizen, as a person who is living here with the privileges of being able to be in a tent like this. Own that right now. Be with me right now in that presence of how freaking lucky you are, how blessed you are, and do not take it for granted. Take responsibility. Take responsibility for the gifts that you have been given, for the privileges that you have, and the opportunity that you have. Yogi Bhajan said that there is a one-third, one-third, one-third philosophy. One-third will go mad. One-third will die, and one-third will wake up. And you know who you are. You know that if you made it to this mat, you are part of the one-third that will wake up. And as a teacher of the light, it is my duty and my mission to remind you of that. You are here on a journey of unlearning and remembering. You are here and you have access to the light at all times. It is through your journey of unlearning and remembering that you remember and accept the presence of the light that you are. And in the presence of that light, you become joyful. And in your joy, you heal the world. In that joy, you heal the world. So would you like to go to a place of joy with me as we close this journey together? As a student of Kundalini Yoga, I've been privileged to have the mantras blessed and bestowed upon me. And that's one of the things I liked most about being a student of Kundalini is the music. And I have the shittiest voice, but man, I love to sing. And I will just, I will sing it loud into the microphone. And this is a mantra I want to share with you that I, I use when I feel out of the light when I feel disconnected to the light. This is a mantra that I use to tune back in. And I'm gonna tell you, you might not wanna walk out at this time. This is a mantra <laughs> that is worth your time. And if you don't get it, get the video. This is, this is a mantra. This is the only mantra that comes with a warning. And the warning is whatever you're thinking about while you're in the presence of this mantra will manifest, will come into form. And so I, I really, don't worry if you have a negative thought, you know what you can do. Witness it and choose again and come home, okay? Just let it go. But in the presence of that mantra, you are creating. And so I, I really challenge you right now to think for a moment about what it is that you want to bring forth. Not what you want to get necessarily, because we all want stuff. You know, I don't want you sitting there and be like, where's the cash? I, <laughs> 
that's fine. I have no problem with you manifesting abundance and sex and whatever the f you want. But right now, let's use this energy, let's use this container, let's use this valley to bring forth joy. Let's hold the intention of magnetic joy. Want to go there with me? Let's all manifest joy. Because in the presence of this joy in this room, with these hundreds of people, we have the power, we have the power to change the world. We will, in this moment, leave an imprint. Please take that seriously. So let's all manifest joy with me. The mantra is Ek Ong Kar Sat Gur Prasad. Ek E K O N G Ong Kar K A U R Sat Gur Prasad. Ek Ong Kar Sat Gur Prasad Sat Gur Prasad Ek Ong Kar. The music is sung by my friend Jai Jagdish. She's amazing. You're going to want the music. Telling you now, just go Google my name and Miracle Meditation, because every one of you is going to be coming up to me later about, wait, I got that music? So just Google my name and Miracle Meditation, and you can find this music. And we're going to go together. Ekon Kar Sat Gur Prasad, and we are going to manifest joy. So let's bring it in. Eyes closed, sitting up straight, palms facing upward. Take a deep breath in. Ong Namo, Gurudev Namo. I bow to the inner wisdom within. Ong Namo, Gurudev Namo. Ong Namo, Gurudev Namo. Ekong Kar, Sadgur Prasad. Sadgur Prasad. Ekong Kar, we're going to chant it together. Here together to manifest joy, to manifest light, to go back to where we came from. Satgur Prasad, Satgur Prasad, Ek Onkar, Ek Onkar, Satgur Prasad, Satgur Prasad, Ek Onkar. Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad Satanguru Prasad Ekonkar Eyes closed Ekonkar Hold the energy of the room Satanguru Prasad Ekonkar Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad Satanguru Prasad Ekonkar Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad Satanguru Prasad Cultivate joy, allow the mantra to elevate you. Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad. Satanguru Prasad, Ekonkar, Ekonkar, Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad, Ekonkar, Ekonkar, Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad, Ekonkar. Sing with conviction. Miracles arise out of conviction. Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar. Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar, calling on that joy. Take a moment for the mountain. Ekonkar Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. Ekonkar. Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad, Ekonkar, Ekonkar, Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad, Ekonkar, Ekonkar, Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad, Ekonkar, Ekonkar, Satanguru Prasad, Satanguru Prasad. 
such a glorious sight, such a glorious sight, Echo Car. Go louder. This is the end. We're nearing the end. Let's bring it. Let's elevate it. Let's expand it. Allow. Echo Car, such a glorious sight, such a glorious sight, Echo Car. For those who need our joy, let's send our joy all over this valley, far beyond, far and wide. Sing it for the joy of the world. Sing. Sitting in your stillness. Feel the joy of your magnitude. Feel the presence of your light. Feel the blessings of your life. Holding the energy right now, make a commitment to yourself to take this energy home with you, to take this joy and this magnificence home with you, to bring it into every corner of your life, to invite it into your darker moments. Use this as your greatest virtue, your joy is your greatest gift. Take a deep breath in and own that joy. Feel it cultivating in your heart. Own it, own it, own it, hold it, hold it. And on the exhale, let it go, give it away. One more deep breath in, breathe it, breathe it, breathe it, breathe it. Own it, hold it, hold it, hold it, be it. And give it away. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Thank you for going there with me. Thank you for your receptivity. Thank you for remembering the magnitude of who you are. Thank you for being my partners in this journey of being the light. Thank you for remembering it's not what you say or what you do. It's how you be. It's how you be. How are you going to be? I welcome you as you go throughout this journey here at Wanderlust to continue to ask yourself that all through the day. How can I be the light? How can I be the light? It is a true privilege and an honor to be able to teach you Wanderlust Squaw Valley. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.